church. Are you excited to be in God's house today? I know I am. And I'm also excited for those that are watching online. We have Illinois, North Carolina, Virginia, Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Maine. I know the first service, uh, we had a bunch of different countries as well. So we are really glad that you are joining us, and we are really glad that all of you are in here today. Uh, for our series, we've been in called The Table. I'm excited to dive into this because uh, for those of you that might not know me, I love gathering people around my table. I've always been that way. As a matter of fact, I love to cook. I have written two cookbooks, and if you didn't know this about me, I used to go on NBC and do a cooking show on NBC. So the table is a big deal to me. I love gathering people together. And, and not only do we enjoy food, but we enjoy conversations. Uh, we enjoy each other's company. We laugh. We cry. Uh, we sometimes sing songs around the table. And if you're married to Troy Maxwell like I am, there has to be some games around the table. Everything has to be a competition with Troy. Everything gets turned into a competition. Uh, we reminisce. We think about years gone by. We dream about the future. Uh, and we make connection. The table is a symbol of family community, and proximity. It's a symbol of our deep desire to be known and to know. There's nothing like gathering around a table together. As a matter of fact, um, my kids are grown now. My youngest is actually going to be 22 this week. Man, it makes me feel a little bit old, but that's all right. So she's going to be 22 this week, but when my kids were in high school, every night of the week, we would have people around the table, and we always had a rule, we never turn anybody away from our table. Now, they might not get to eat the same thing as everybody else, because sometimes the, the bowl runs dry, but that's what Tostitos and and, you know, the chips and salsa. And then I also had the little, you know, the little pizza pockets, the little Totinos. Y'all know those? Those were always in the freezer. Or we had mama's pizza on speed dial. So we would always accommodate, even though you might not all get to eat the same thing. We had a rule. We never say no. We just always extend the table. So all throughout high school, I mean, there'd be nights we'd have 10 people gathered around the table. And I remember this one night, my kids kind of gave me the heads up. I got a phone call. I said, hey, mom, we just want to let you know we've invited this guy over. They told me his name, and they said he's the biggest druggie at Huff High School. That's where my kids went. And I was like, great. I'm glad that you've invited him over for dinner. I didn't really know what to make of that, but I said, you know what, we'll set an extra table setting. And so here we were eating uh, mama's pizza. If you guys lived in Lake Norman, and I know you probably don't, otherwise you wouldn't be at this campus, but that's the place to order pizza in Lake Norman. We don't order Domino's. We don't order Pizza Hut. We don't order Papa John's. We are eating Mama's New York-style pizza with a side of meatballs. That's what I'm talking about. That's some good eating right there. 
Y'all are jealous. You wished you lived in Lake Norman now. So I remember this young man coming and sitting at our table, and he was actually sitting to my right. He was sitting at the head of the table where my husband uh, normally would sit. And we began talking, and he was uh, 17 years old, and he said, so I guess you heard about me, huh? And I said, maybe. And he goes, yeah, I kind of have a bit of a reputation. And I said, well, is it true? And he said, is what true? I said, your reputation. I said, what is your reputation? He said, well, you know, people say I do a lot of drugs. And I said, well, do you? And he said, kind of, yeah. And I said, well, why? Why do you take so many drugs? What, what's up with that? And he, he said, well, you know, I just really like it. I just like drugs. And I said, really? And he's like, yeah. And I said, well, you know, I was thinking it was something different. And I could just tell. I just knew my kids were bracing. They knew that, that Mama P was about to break loose. I said, well, I was thinking it was kind of something different. He's like, well, what were you thinking? I said, well, I was thinking you were kind of hiding something. And you, you see, the reason that I have learned, and I said, I, obviously, you've heard a little bit about me. You know I'm a pastor. I said, but I'm also a mom. And I said, let me tell you something. I said, people don't just do drugs. They're running from something. I said, it's the same with any type of addictive behavior, whether it's alcohol or pornography, any type of addictive behavior, it's usually because you're trying to drown something out. And I looked at him and I said, what are you trying to drown out? And he said, well, I don't know. And I said, well, what in life hurts you? What makes you sad? And all of a sudden, you could see his face completely shift. And he said, well, my parents don't even really know that I exist. All they do is fight and argue and fuss with each other. And it's like I'm not even there. They don't, they don't even acknowledge me or pay attention to me. I just feel alone. I feel like nobody cares. And I said, ah, oh, okay, I see. I said, so do you think maybe that's why you could do drugs? And he said, well, you know, when I do drugs, I just, I don't have to feel anything. He said, for that little bit of time, I just, I either don't feel anything at all or I feel good for a little bit. And then that wears off and I'm sad again. And I said, well, what about if you could actually go to the root of what is making you sad? And you could process that out. And I said, I'm not even talking about your parents arguing and fighting because that's something that you can't control. But what if you had a relationship with somebody that you knew was always there for you, even when you didn't feel like other people were? And he said, well, I'd, I'd like that, but I don't, I don't really have anybody like that. I said, oh, but you do. You just hadn't met him yet. I said, let me tell you about him. And I began to tell him about Jesus right there at the kitchen table over mama's pizza. And listen, I like to make homemade stuff. I like to make pasta from scratch. I love feeding people. I love doing all that. But you know what? None of that is what mattered. This young man just knew he had a seat at our table. Even if I had to dial up the pizza place, he just knew he was welcomed and he just knew he was accepted. He just knew it was for however long a place of peace. And I started to think, maybe my kids were on to something. Before we invite someone to God's table, maybe we should learn to invite them to ours first and just love on people. We'd pick him up and he'd come to youth group with the kids every week. And I remember one time we went to pick him up. He would normally be sitting on his front porch, not wanting to be in the house. And he'd be sitting outside smoking. I'm not going to say he immediately got rid of the drugs. He'd be sitting on his front porch smoking. And you know what I'm talking about. It wasn't a cigarette. And we'd pick him up. 
and we take him to youth group. One time we went to pick him up and he wasn't there. He wasn't sitting on his front porch and we knocked on the door and his mom said that he had run off earlier. We found him a few doors down. He was kind of hiding in the bushes and he was crying. He had watched his parents get into yet another fight. And we took him to youth group with us that night. That young man, I don't know what he's doing today, but I can tell you there was a season of his life where he knew that the Maxwells welcomed him at the table and that he always had a place that would be set for him no matter what. And I think sometimes maybe we misunderstand or maybe we don't fully understand the table and what that looks like and why it's talked about so many times in the Bible all throughout Scripture. It's a place where God dwells with and provides for his people. God sets a table for us, and then God himself joins us around that table. Now, tables don't always look like what they look like today. As a matter of fact, you know, in Bible times, they would take a piece of linen, a piece of tapestry, they would take a piece of leather or a fur and they would throw it on the ground and they would put their utensils and their dishes on top of that. It wasn't until actually after uh, the Israelites' captivity that the table even became raised a little bit off the ground. That's why where you see so many times in Scripture where it says they reclined at table, it's because they were down on the ground. And so... Tables began to evolve, and we actually have our tables lifted up now, but the symbolism and the meaning of the table hasn't changed. God actually instructed, there were seven different feasts, and God instructed these feasts to come together and remember specific things. I know we just celebrated as a church Passover together. On Good Friday, we did a Passover Seder, and all the elements on the table were walked through and discussed on what each thing means as it relates to the table. The thing that's so interesting to me is why God chose a table and why God chose food to get very important Uh, principles down into our hearts. Why did God institute seven feasts and say, you need to remember these? Well, think about it. When we sit at the table and we engage in a meal together, all five of our senses are engaged. Our smell, touch, sight, taste, sound. In other words, what God is saying is every part of you I want engaged in what I'm doing. So around the table, Jesus comforts, Jesus corrects, and Jesus calls higher. And we're going to see that today as we walk through. I'm going to talk from the book of Luke. You will see scriptures all throughout the Bible that deal with a table. But today I'm going to specifically stay in Luke And I'm not going to just talk about this from the standpoint of just Jesus eating meals with someone, but the scriptures that I'm going to reference in Luke are specifically meals where Jesus was the host of the meal. When Jesus hosted a meal, he was very intentional, and we're going to see that play out today. Now, when I talk about food, I talk about it differently than my husband. Because I like to cook, I'm all about taste. It's got to taste good. It's got to look good. It's got to smell good. My husband, he loves to work out, and so he eats for fuel. He eats because he wants to have his body powered. But I remind him that we have over 10,000 taste buds, so obviously that wasn't Jesus' only intention. I think that food might actually, gathering around a table, might actually be one of Jesus' love languages. Because you see Jesus eating with his disciples. You see him eating with tax collectors and sinners. 
You see him eating with the Pharisees. You see Jesus eating with a prostitute. You see him eating with the multitudes that are hungry, both spiritually and naturally. And the table has a purpose to it. It is missional, it is communal, and it's hospitable. So the book of Luke, as we're getting ready to dive into, I want you to take away specific things. First, I want you to understand that all three of these interactions where Jesus is the host happen in the evening. In all three of these interactions, Jesus is speaking about the kingdom that is to come while he is hosting these suppers. So we can't miss the significance of those three things. And Luke chapter 9 is the first reference where Jesus is the host at a supper. And it's Jesus feeding the 5,000. He's been teaching all day long. And nighttime starts to approach. And in Luke 9, it says that when the day began to wear away, the 12 came, his disciples, and said to him, hey, Jesus, why don't you send the multitudes away that they may go into the surrounding towns and country and lodge and get provisions because we're in a deserted place. Somebody say deserted place. We're in a deserted place here. But Jesus said to them, you give them something to eat. Can you just imagine those disciples going, didn't we just say we're in a deserted place? And and they kind of answer back to him. And in my mind, it's sarcastic. Maybe that's just because I'm filtering it through my personality. It says, but then they say, we have no more than five loaves and two fish. Unless we go buy food for all these people, there's 5,000 men, let alone women and children. Are you saying you want us to go to all these surrounding towns, buy food for 5,000 men, women, and children, cart it all back here and feed them? By then it's going to be dark. So I'm thinking there's a little sarcasm going here. Like, Jesus, did you not just hear what we had to say? And then Jesus said to his disciples... Make them sit down in groups of 50. And they did so, and they made them all sit down. Then it says, Jesus took, say took, the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed, say blessed, and broke, say broke, them, and gave, say gave, them to the disciples to set before the multitude. Here's the thing that I love about this scripture is that you can be in a deserted place and God can still provide for your needs. You can be in a deserted situation and God can still take care of you even when your mind can't comprehend. Where is this going to come from? God, how are you going to provide? God, how are you going to show up in my deserted, my dry relationship? God, how are you going to show up financially? My bank account is looking pretty dry, God. God, how are you going to come through? And here's the thing that I love. Jesus could have just done this miracle on his own. But he included the disciples in it so he could help build their faith for the future. Every time God does a breakthrough in your life, it's to help equip you for the future. So you understand time and time again, he's good for his word. Even when you feel like you're in a dry place, even when you're having a hard time, even when something's difficult, You may feel deserted, but God is right there. All he's asking is, will you give your little bit over so he can multiply it? But we've got to be willing to give up what we think is our little bit. You know, it's it's interesting. Our daughter uh, texted us yesterday, 
And she said, hey, could you uh, please pray for me? She, um, she works for Mercedes-Benz, and she's uh, just one of their top car dealers. And she said, hey, pray for me. Sales have been really slow this month for everyone. And the first thing out of my husband's mouth is he texts back to her, and he said, well, if sales aren't looking good, you better get some seed in the ground. She goes, what do you mean? And he said, if you're having a hard time, you can't expect a harvest off seed you've never sown. You better get some seed in the ground. She said, oh, got it, going online right now. You see, sometimes to us, it may look like a deserted situation, but when we take our little bit and we give it over to God, Jesus' math is always better than ours. That's something he constantly tries to teach us. If you're in sales, the biggest thing you can do, if you're saying, God, man, I need a breakthrough, you better give them your little fishes and loaves. Give them what you think is small and insignificant, and you watch how he gives it back to you because he always gives it back more than what you gave. That's a principle he was trying to teach our 22-year-old because it's exactly what Jesus did with that bread. He took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it. This is the only meal prior to the Last Supper in Luke where Jesus is the host. And he uses very specific language that ties this actually to the Last Supper and all three suppers that we're going to talk about today. Jesus can certainly do a miracle without us, but aren't you glad he includes us in the miracle? I'm so thankful. And here's the other thing Jesus was trying to do is these these guys who were listening, all the crowds and the multitude, the disciples, they were all familiar with the stories of Moses. They had all of Moses' writings. They knew what God had done for Moses and the Israelites in the wilderness. And what Jesus did was a repeat performance. The deliverer of the Old Testament, Moses, they are now standing in front of the deliverer of the New Testament, Jesus, and yet again, he's feeding them in the wilderness. In the Old Testament, it was manna that rained down from heaven, bread that came directly from God. Now, Jesus is trying to teach them the bread that God has already given to you. Learn how to give it away. Learn how to give it back and let me multiply it. So you've got the deliverer from the Old Testament. Now, they are face to face with the deliverer from the New Testament. Next, we go to Luke 22, and it says, When the hour had come, he sat down. This is Jesus having the Passover meal with his disciples. Says the 12 apostles with him. Then he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Now, the Passover meal was always supposed to be eaten with family. And so they have all left their families and come, and they're with Jesus now. So Jesus is basically letting them know that, hey, guys, we are a family. We have the same blood. We have the same blood. It doesn't matter the bloodline that you came from naturally. I'm letting you know that spiritually, We're the same, and I'm about to do something to prove that to you. So they sit down for this Passover, and Jesus says, we're going to have this Passover before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And they're probably scratching their heads going, okay, we're familiar with Passover, but we're not sure what you're saying right now. Then it says he took the cup and he gave thanks and he said, take this and divide it among yourselves for I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And you know, they're probably going, okay, we're we're not totally understanding you. 
And then Jesus, it says, and he took bread, then he gave thanks, then he broke it, and then he gave it to them, and he said to them, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. In other words, you knew the old covenant which you would have to shed the blood of an animal in order to be covered of your sins, but that was the old covenant, the Old Testament. You are now entering into a new covenant, a new testament, which is built upon better promises. You no longer have to shed the blood of an innocent, spotless animal. I now have become the ultimate sacrifice, and I'm about to shed my blood for you. So the game is about to change. In essence, you are now not just going to celebrate the Passover meal, but you are now celebrating communion which from this point forward, the next year when the Passover comes, you're going to remember not just the lamb where the blood was put on the doorpost for Passover. You are now going to remember the lamb of God, which I am, and the blood post over the door of your life. And now you no longer have to sacrifice those animals. I have become the ultimate sacrifice for you. And every time you break that bread, every time you drink that cup, you are to remember that sacrifice and what I have done for you. That is what we did today. We took the bread, we paused, we remembered his broken body, and then we ate of that bread. We took of the cup, we drank, we paused, and we remembered the crown of thorns that was pushed down on his head where he bled, and that blood allowed us in our minds to be set free, that crown of thorns. And we remember the stripes that he received on his back that paid for our healing so we don't have to live with sickness and disease, that it is under the blood. We also remember the nails that were pierced through his hands. And when that blood shed and he gave up his life, his life was not taken from him. The Bible says he freely gave it. And when he shed that blood and the nails pierced through his hands, that allowed redemption from our sins. Anything we had done, anything we're currently doing, or anything in the future that we are to do is under the blood. So when the devil tries to remind you of your past, you say, no, 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 it's under the blood. When the devil tries to confuse you about your future, you say, oh, no, it is under the blood. It is under the blood. And not just like the Old Testament covered by the blood. The New Testament covenant was ratified, which means that it's not covered. It was actually completely erased. So we have that relationship with Jesus, and we get to come boldly to the table, boldly to the throne room of grace because we have entrance by the blood. So here they are sitting. They're taking all of this in, and, and they would sit, and they would eat this Passover meal, and they would remember all the way back to creation when man fell, and they had to shed the blood of an animal to be redeemed. They would remember back to the flood and how 
God flooded the earth, but there was a promise of redemption and how God would never flood the earth again. They would remember the Exodus when they were leaving Egypt and how the 10 plagues that hit the Egyptians, it did not hit them. They would remember when they crossed over the Jordan and entered into the promised land. They had so much to remember and to be thankful for. But Jesus is saying, listen, The game is changing now. You're not going to just remember the lamb's blood that you posted on the door. You're going to remember the capital L lamb and what I have done for you. So next year when you come to celebrate Passover, you're going to be celebrating my death and my resurrection on the cross. And this is when he instituted communion. And how we are to remember. Because God wants his people since the very beginning of time to understand that he's always been there. Even times where it seemed like God was silent, he was still there. He was behind the scenes doing work even when it didn't seem like it. He was always there. It's just like last weekend when we celebrated the resurrection. Friday was hard. It was hard to think about all that Jesus went through, and Saturday was silent. It could have seemed like that death had won. But see, while it seemed silent to us, God was working behind the scenes. He was going down into the pit of hell and taking the keys of death and the grave. So it may have looked on the surface like things were silent, but God was behind the scenes working. And any time that we want to remember what he did, his sacrifice, we don't have to be in church to take communion. We can take communion at home by ourselves. We can turn on our worship music. I'm telling you, that's why sometimes when you're really going through a hard, hard time, one of the most difficult things to do is to pray. We want to run to the phone. We we want to consult somebody else. And God is just like, man, I've got the answer if you just come to me. But we have trained ourselves to go every which way. We run to everything else. We we run to alcohol. We run to pornography. We run to food. We run from relationship to relationship. And God's like, I'm just waiting for you to learn to come to me. All you who are heavy, all you who are have burdens on your shoulders. I'm just waiting for you to come to me because I am where you will find your rest. He's like, I'm just waiting. But it's so hard to go to God in prayer when we're hurting because the enemy intentionally will put traps in the way and keep you back. Sometimes we just need to lay down on the floor and turn on some worship music and just lay there. And I do that sometimes when I'm feeling low because I'm like, I can't get any lower than the floor. And I lay on the floor, and I just turn on a worship song. One of my favorite that I love right now is the Run to the Father. I love that song. I love the one that we did today, Reason to Praise. No matter what you're going through, there is always a reason to praise. I don't care how hard it's raining in your life. Remember Without the rain, that seeds don't grow. We like the sunshine, but sunshine every day won't produce fruit in your life. We like the candy, but without the spinach and the greens, we don't grow. We want to live from candy moment to candy moment to candy moment. That doesn't sustain you and nourish you. You learn more in your deepest, darkest, hurting moments than you ever learn on a mountaintop. Because in those valley moments, you got to learn to get up again. 
You got to learn that you still got a reason to praise. You still got something to be thankful for. You still got a hallelujah. So God instituted this sacred meal so we could constantly come back and remember. We could remember his death, his burial, and his resurrection. He, you know, he could have, and if it was me, I would have probably done this. He could have just talked about all the terrible suffering. Do you guys realize what I'm about to go through? The most agony ever. Do you understand all that's going to happen to me? He could have just talked about that. But he didn't. He didn't talk about that because he wanted their focus on the right thing. He wanted them to understand that they would need to remember from that night forward what he was about to do, that they could always call on that name, that he was always close by, he was always near, and any time they wanted to remember, it was as easy as picking up the cup and picking up the bread. You see, the Jews had gathered as families for a very long time, and they were used to celebrating the meal together, but what they weren't used to is now the shift had changed, and now every time they celebrated, it was because of Jesus, the Lamb's blood, the capital L, Lamb's blood. And so here they were, understanding and learning that this was a practice that now had been converted in the hands of Jesus. This meal that they used to look back and think about how they were saved from the clutches of Egypt is now representation of how they were saved from the clutches of hell. And Jesus begins to prophetically speak to them And lets them know about all that he's coming to do and all that he's going to fulfill. And that every need that they have or will ever have is going to be met once and for all. His death, his burial, and his resurrection. Communion is all about remembrance. In Luke 24 is the third reference that I want to bring to you today before we close And in Luke 24, this is after Jesus had already died and he's risen again. As a matter of fact, we know what happened Easter morning, how the women came to the tomb and the tomb was empty. We know what Easter morning looked like. We may even know the story of Easter afternoon where Two of the disciples of Jesus were walking down the road to Emmaus, and Jesus shows up to them, and they don't know it's him, just like the ladies at the tomb didn't know that it was Jesus they encountered. But these two disciples that afternoon were walking on the road, and they began to have these conversations with Jesus, and they're thinking, man, this guy is really wise. He shares with them the teachings of Moses. And he begins to prophesy. He begins to speak of future things. And they are just blown away at all that he knows. But most of us don't know what happened that Easter evening. We don't know that Jesus actually hosted yet another dinner around the table. And in Luke's story, Jesus appears to his disciples that evening no longer around the tomb and not on the road to Emmaus, but now they're sitting around a dinner table. And he's still talking with the disciples. And they are thinking how wise and smart. And at this time, there's a whole lot more of them. And they're all impressed by what manner of wisdom this man has. And you just have to know Jesus is probably internally laughing because they don't recognize it's him. And he begins to, at the table, disciple them. And it says, now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, as Jesus sat at the table with the disciples, 
Check this out, third time we hear this. It says, he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. As soon as he did that, it says, then their eyes were opened and they knew him and he vanished from their sight. In verse 35, it says that he was known to us in the breaking of bread. In other words, Jesus came back again to let them know one last time, don't forget to do this. I've showed you this multiple times. In fact, that's how they recognized it was Jesus. They're like, wait a minute. He took the bread. Wait a second. He blessed it. Hold on. He broke it. And then he gave it. They noticed the pattern, and they immediately realized who it was. You see, the Passover was originally celebrated by the Jews, but the Passover today is what we call the Lord's Supper, and all of us as followers of Jesus celebrate it today. And then, one day in eternity, we will celebrate at another table It's called the banquet at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we have that invitation. But I want you to understand there's the Lord's supper and then there's the Lord's table and they are two separate things. The Lord's supper is instituted by Jesus and we saw it the night of the Passover, the night before his death and remembrance by breaking bread and drinking. It's communion, it's what we did today as a church family. But the Lord's table is different. The Lord's table is not actually a literal table. It's a symbolic table of us entering into fellowship with the Lord, it's salvation. And once, You have come to the Lord's table. Once you have accepted salvation, then you can come to the Lord's Supper and you can receive communion because you're remembering of something you've already accepted in your life, which is the shed blood of Jesus. I want to wrap this all up to say this that Jesus many times called himself the bread of life. I remember as a little girl thinking that that was strange. I also remember as a little girl thinking that communion is strange. Why does he say to drink his blood and to eat his body? That's a little creepy. It's a little weird. Come on, you know you thought the same thing. But this is what Jesus was saying. He was the bread of life. Jesus was taken and arrested. Jesus prayed to the Father for his will to be done and God blessed him. Jesus was most assuredly broken, not his physical bones, but his body was beaten He was emotionally, mentally, and even in spiritual ways abused, betrayed, mocked, scourged, spit upon, and ultimately crucified. Yet, Jesus gave of himself as he willingly died on the cross. He was taken, blessed, broken, and then he gave. Can you stand on your feet with me today?
would you just close your eyes and bow your heads? If you could just bring down the lights in here, that would be great. Whether you're watching online or whether you're in here today, I want you to know that you are invited to the table. You are invited to the table today. Matter of fact, there's a little place card that has your name on it. You may have been gone for a while, but the seat has been saved for you. We've been waiting for you to come back. We've been waiting for you to come home. We've been waiting for you to come to the table. I want to ask you this question today with heads bowed, with eyes closed. If you need to come back to the table, whether you're online, there's a hand there you can click, or whether you're in this room, and maybe you've been distant from God. Maybe you pushed your seat back from the table, and the table's still in your sight, but maybe you haven't scooted your chair up. I want you to do something bold today. I want you to get out of your seat and I want you to come up front. I want you to stand here with me. The Lord showed me that there were people in here that were going to have a turnaround, a breakthrough in their life today because they were gonna be bold, they were gonna be courageous. So people who have needed to come back to the table or maybe you kind of pushed your seat back a little bit. But today you would say, I need a fresh start. I need a do-over. I need a turnaround. H how do I know if that's me? Because right now you feel it in your heart. You feel it in your chest. And you're going, man, that's me. I want you to have the courage to come up front because God gave me a picture of you. There's seven people in here that need to be up front right now, seven of you. And I'm gonna wait for all seven of you. We're gonna stand here and wait because God is so good like that. He wants you to know that that's your seat. That's not somebody else's seat. That is a seat that was saved just for you. And he's got time to wait. One, two, three, four, five, six. Here we go. There we are. Come on up here. Y'all can take this down for me. That would be great. Just come up here. Who else needs to know they have a seat at the table? What's your name? Seraphin. Man, God is working on you right now. Wow. You know what he wants you to know? He'd rather have you messy than not at all. He's not afraid of your mess. Could I get some of my men just to come up behind him? Big, strong man. We need more men like you, big, strong men that are willing to be bold and come up and stand and go, you know what, I'm not perfect, but I know the one who is. Welcome back to the table. Welcome back. Are you with him? It's your son. What a great example. You come into the table too? Welcome home, son. How old are you? You're 14. No better place to be than at the table. I'm proud of you. What's your name? What? Cash. And you got a cool name. You believe God can do something big in your life? You're, he said, I need it. I agree. You know that 17 year old boy that I told you was at my table? All he needed was an encounter. That's all he needed. 
Have you ever lifted your hands up before? Let me just get you to take your hands. Just lift your hands up, Cash. Just close your eyes. Dad, you lift your hands up alongside him. The rest of you, lift your hands up. Look at this. I told you there were seven people God was waiting on. Count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. God knows what He's doing. And He will wait. And He will chase after one. He will chase after one 14-year-old boy. Leave the rest and go chase him down. No matter what it is you're going through today, there is still a reason for you to praise. No matter what hard, no matter what difficult thing, there is still a reason to praise. Y'all close your eyes, everyone in here, just close your eyes and lift your hands up. Y'all sing this out. Father, we come.